Hey, Deserving Listeners, 90 Day Fiance. Let's watch. There is a chance of reconciliation. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows down the road? Maybe she just needs to go get everything out of her system and uh, go live her dreams and stuff. There's nothing wrong with that, you know? I applaud her for it, but I'm not going to wait around forever. Interesting. I did not expect that response, but then when I think about everything that Mike has said over the years, it's consistent that uh, on one hand, we can point out that he's saying something nice. It's He's saying, you know, I applaud her that she wants to you know, live her dreams, whatever he said there. So that's nice to say. We want those kinds of uh, goodwill attitudes towards each other through a divorce, through a breakup. But... He's saying, who knows, maybe reconciliation is possible. And maybe it is. And I'll point out that relationships are messy and breakups are messy. And it, I wouldn't be totally surprised if they get back together and, and try to make it work again and break up again later on. Uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me. And I've been through enough with clients to learn that relationships are messy and that breakups are messy and that society often doesn't like that. Friends will say, like, just clean break, just you know, let it go. And okay, I think the only reason why, so if, if we are watching and we're like, no, don't get back together. Well, it's easy for us to say because we're, we don't have the affection and the love or the longing that they probably have for each other. It's easy for us to say, and why would we say that? Why would we want that to happen? Uh, including myself, by the way, when I watch it, I'm like, no, don't, don't do that. You should try to find compatibility somewhere else. But for me, and maybe for other people watching, and for friends, I think in particular, we don't want to deal with it. There's tension when we feel it. It feels uneasy. We don't know how to define it. Is this a good relationship? Is it a bad relationship? Are they going to be together? Are they not? And it's easier for us to just say, break up, and I don't, ha and I don't have to deal with it anymore. Whereas that denies, of course, the experience of being in the relationship. It's also possible that Mike does suffer from avoidant attachment and is not fully acknowledging the situation. Some people with avoidant attachment will have that. Now, uh, he's not he's going against the grain. So it, evidence against avoidant attachment is the fact that he's still open to possibly reconciling with her. Where as most people with avoidant attachment, once things get a little hairy, they will run and they're like, nope, it's done. I'm on my own. I'm moving on. I've, I've completely dropped that like a sack of potatoes. I'm moving on. And he's not doing that. I know myself I'm a good person, but I, I'm tired to fight. So I don't care, I don't give a f He has to fall for divorce, and I will say okay, and we just fought. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure she can file for divorce as well. I mean, I don't know if the K-1 visa affects this at all, but, uh, you know, at least in from my understanding of the law in Washington State, which is where they got married and where they lived, that either partner can file. Best case scenario, you, you both file and you both sign all the documents and you both go to the courthouse and you both go through the steps. So let's see if they do that. I'm gonna go file, I haven't done anything yet. And uh, after if you divorce, you send she back to Ukraine and she go back home or she stay here? I'd imagine she stay here. Mike, you're so nice guy. You need nice girl who love you like and just need cooking meat for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Julia. I agree with Julia. I mean not the meat part per se, but the compatibility part. The part that uh, you know, you're you're similar. You you come from a similar background. You have similar goals in life. You have similar lifestyle. Someone who maybe lives in his town, who likes to live and swim, who likes to eat meat, who likes to drink beer, or at least doesn't get on your case for doing so, who likes to just chill. Absolutely. Now, it's possible, and I, I must have talked about this at some point in the hours and hours of commentary on Mike and Natalie, that for some of the Mikes of the world, they actually uh, need or feel like they need someone like Natalie who pursues. Natalie pursued kind of, but um, not always. But she would pursue sometimes and she would give in, right? She would say, I'm sorry, even though she wasn't really sorry. She would try to make up. So the avoiding of people of the world often will need someone to pursue because if two avoidants get into a relationship, sometimes their relationship 
just flies apart because when anything bad happens, they both move away. Uh, for balance, and this is generalizing, it's hard, you know, we're talking about 8 billion people around the planet, so it's hard to know always, but it isn't uncommon for someone like Mike who might suffer from avoiding attachment to have a string of relationships with people who pursue because without that, there wouldn't be any contact. So maybe that quality he requires, and you can make that work. As a therapist, I will see couples like that where one person tends to pursue more often, and you can make that work. It's, it's not inherently dysfunctional. It often will become dysfunctional, particularly without therapy and without self-awareness and without differentiation from both sides, relative d differentiation. Uh, so maybe he needs someone like Natalie who pursues, but maybe someone that is also uh, not super pursuing and who also likes his lifestyle. Absolutely. Just lying to you guys about everything. Everything is all about you. Nothing was about, I love you, I want to be in this relationship. She no. doesn't like his ranch. Why would you come here if you knew he lived out in the middle of nowhere? Why would you come here? You can't tell him that you love him. And now you run off. God bless you. Okay. Yeah, so this is a common prejudicial assumption that Americans will make sometimes, which is, you're just here for the green card. You never really loved him. I don't think that's true. Of course, none of us know because we would have to be in Natalie's heart or know her heart. None of us can. But I think there's a lot of evidence showing that she does, did love Mike and may, might still have feelings for him and wanted to make it work. And instead of Trish seeing it as, well, they're triggering each other. My son has problems too. She has problems. Instead of seeing it in a more rational, differentiated way, she sees it as he, she's the enemy and my son is completely blameless. When one comment pushed Natalie over the edge. Why your mom called me hooker? No one called you hooker. I mean, no one called she you. She thinks I'm a hooker. She said hooker to me. She didn't. My mom did not call I'm you that I'm telling you. She did not call you. As I said, when we first saw this, a more helpful response from Mike would have been something like in his head, he could think, I am 99% sure my mom did not call her a hooker, but I don't really know. I don't think my mom said it. There must have been a misunderstanding there. And then you say, uh, my mom said, what? She called me a hooker. She did? Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure she called me a hooker. Wow, that is, if, that, if that happened, truly awful. And I'm so sorry that my mom did that. But Natalie, I'm wondering if there was a misunderstanding there. Maybe we should talk about it. I'm guessing that if Mike said some sort of approach like that from the beginning, everything would have worked out just fine. At the very least, Natalie would have been like, well, my husband has my back. He, at least on the surface, is entertaining the idea that I'm not a crazy person. And but but because he approached it like she didn't he, she didn't call you that she didn't call you that she how would how could he know there's no way for him to know for sure and natalie knows that he can't know for sure and so I, i'm quite positive that the the calling her hooker was a lot less of a hurt to natalie than mike not at least hearing her out and supporting her and again, you can, and this is important for all, a lot of situations in marriage of, even though in your mind you're like, eh, I don't know, I think that's a distortion. I, I, you know, my partner often has a distortion. In the beginning, the person is distressed. She believes you hook her up to, you hook, you hook Natalie up to a lie detector test, which doesn't exist by the way, but if such a thing did, then she probably would pass the test by believe you know that she literally believes she was called a hooker if she believes that then that's very distressing and so you need to attend to the emotion first and foremost to be like oh my goodness that sounds awful if she said that which i don't know but if it sounds like you believe that then that is awful i'm so sorry that happened that must have felt really bad if you do that 95 percent of the problems just instantly go away but the fact that he didn't do anything close to that, in fact, just shut her down, is I think what caused the problem to become compounded over time. Word. She did. I was raised with respect by my mom. So when she make joke like that towards me, it's kind of okay, I swallow it. But in the end, there are a lot to swallow for one given day, to be honest. 
Now, on the other side of the coin, Natalie could have done well by wondering if she were, if she was distorted, if she didn't hear things quite correctly. Because that is quite an astounding thing for someone to say. Now, we don't know. I mean, given the way Trish talks, I, I'm not going to say that Natalie is wrong here. We don't. We just don't know. It would be a weird thing to say, particularly if you're mic'd up. But you know, we've heard worse things before from people on the show, so it wouldn't be that strange. But for Natalie to just assume that she understands the context, that she heard her right, is also not necessarily helpful. Now, maybe it was crystal clear. And, and now the whole question I've had this whole time is, they're mic'd up. So why didn't we hear the word in question so that we as the viewers can evaluate that? Are you having a major malfunction or what? Anyone I'm ready to go to Europe. Well, yeah, well, we're not ready to go. You gotta okay, get on the plane. Okay, we're call. Just come out here and speak. She did nothing to you. So yeah, this is a pretty frustrating moment. And I don't think anyone was, you know, very functional in this situation. For Natalie to not say anything, it, 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 it all depends on the goals. And presumably at this point, Mike and Natalie were still trying to make the marriage work. So if that's true, which we don't know, then Natalie should do something here and just be like, okay, well, the reason why I'm upset is because I think you, Trish, called me a hooker and that really hurt my feelings. Okay. So the fact that now he's like, well, I don't want to talk about it, even though it's clear that she's upset. So that's on Natalie. And for Mike, what he could have said something, like, okay, well, like, apparently my wife is having a bit of a problem right now. And he could have just risen above it and done the mature thing and said, mom, she thinks you called her a hooker and I wasn't there. So can we talk about that right now? And because if you did say that, that's awful. But I don't think you said that because I don't think you would say something like that, you know, and have some sort of conversation. So Mike could have done that, but he he isn't. He's just, you know, I don't know what Mike's why, what the barrier would be there for Mike not to just voice that. Uh, is it the avoidant attachment? Is it some kind of scapegoating of Natalie? I don't really understand. And for Trish. She could help by, if she wants to make this work as well, which we don't know is true, then she could say, Natalie, I'm getting the impression that you think I did something wrong and I'm here to listen, you know, if, there, if there's something I did wrong. So I think all three of them were participating in the entrenchment of their conflict. You sit back there and pout all you want. Natalie, do you still say that Trish called you a hooker? I heard it. Honestly, I don't know. I swear I heard it. I did not call you a hooker. You never. This is the conversation they should have had from the beginning. <laughs> Why not in the moment? The walls go up and the dysfunctional behavior goes up and they couldn't have had this conversation within a few minutes of, of what happened. Who uh... said that? I never called her a hooker. It's just another one of your lies, Natalie. Okay. Another, okay. You lie constantly. Okay. okay. You just lie about everything. And through the assumption and the prejudiced lens that Trish has, which might be influential on Mike's attitude, is that she lies all the time. She's an evil human being. Whereas Natalie's saying, look, that's what I heard. She even, I think, was implying, maybe you didn't say hooker, but that's what I heard. I heard you call me a hooker. Instead of just hearing that and saying, well, maybe she heard a word wrong. It's no, you're lying. You're just, what is Natalie trying to lie about? What nefarious game has Natalie been up to? Uh, to move to squim? <laughs> what has she lied about, Trish? She doesn't care about Michael. She never did. She just wanted to get to America. You don't think she loved Mike at all? I don't, I, no. See, there it is. And no offense to people who live in squim. Squim's a beautiful, town, but we all know that Natalie doesn't want to live in Squim. That's what I mean. <laughs> I don't want to put down my uh, fellow Squim, Squimites? What do we call people from Squim? Squim, Squim, Inuit, Squimians, Squimanians. So she has this belief, very common. She's only in it for the green card. It's, uh, is it motivated by xenophobia, racism, pr protectiveness of her son, all the above? It, it's just this automatic assumption that the person is a con artist, is evil. I don't, I don't know if anyone believes that. Uh, do you believe that? I, I don't think that's true. There are so many quicker, plus 
there's so many. Anyway, I, I, I just don't think that's true. I can't know if it's true, but it doesn't seem like it's true. No. In the beginning, we were. It was real. It was real. How many times did you go over there and you come back and you were like, it was a horrible trip? It was a horrible really? trip. Really? It was a horrible trip? Like when no, you went to Paris. it wasn't a horrible trip. Good. This is exactly what should ha happen is Mike should defend Natalie and their relationship and say, no, mom, actually, it was real in the beginning. It was absolutely real. All right. Well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.